Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Celine Ricci and I'm the director of Ars Minerva. Uh, if you're not uh, familiar with us, our main mission is to bring back forgotten music uh, to life, especially <coughs> operas that haven't been uh, played since the 17th or 18th centuries. Uh, so welcome to our cocktails and chit chat session dedicated to costume design <laughs> and craft. And I'm here with Matthew Nash. <laughs> chin chin, <laughs> Matthew. <laughs> so <laughs> Matthew, a cocktail is anything vodka. So Matthew has just vodka <laughs> and I have vodka and orange. Uh, so chin chin everyone um, and uh, again thanks for being with us tonight. Um, so Matthew is with uh, Ars Minerva since 2017. We met because I posted an announcement on uh, um, yeah so you saw it on Craigslist no. but at the beginning I posted it on the board match uh, and uh, and Matthew responded, it was like a miracle, he responded 15 days before we did a show, an opera called the Circe from 1665 and we were very, very far behind and Matthew made all the costume for men in 15 days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. um, and uh, so this was our, uh, our first collaboration and since uh, Matthew has been making costume for uh, two operas, which are uh, Iphigenia in Aulide uh, and uh, Ermelinda, but he also made costume for an event that we did called Women of the Mediterranean. So I'm very happy to <laughs> have Matthew here with us tonight. Um, and so I'm going to um, uh, just give uh, to Matthew here the presentation. So thank you. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. So, okay. So, so uh, hello. I, I met with Celine in March of 2018 to talk about her design concepts for Ephesian she wanted the singers to have one costume for the character of their singing role and a second to be worn on top as the Greek chorus of onlookers. As the singers were never to leave the stage, this had to come off and be put back on in full view of the audience. Taking it off would be relatively easy, but I had to join the mask and hood to a cap to make, oh, where am I? Sorry. <laughs> uh, to make sure that when they put the robe back on, the mask would line up perfectly with their face. Although the robes all look the same, the length and mask placement was different for each singer. So this took a lot of practice in rehearsals. Yeah, I remember, right? Yeah. <laughs> it was really difficult to put and, and back and, yeah. uh, but it was great. I mean, it was an amazing job. Yeah, I commend the entire cast for their patience and cooperation to make that happen. <laughs> I wanted the style of the character costumes to reflect what I consider to be the essence of Ars Minerva, a blend of the ancient Greek, Baroque, and modern time. This is Spencer Dodd as Arcade. The men's costumes were all this interpretation of a hoodie and sweatpants. The velvet was cut in diagonal asymmetrical panels with some pleated draping detail, a modern twist on a Greek tunic. For the warriors, I wanted to add a Baroque style of armor. For the breastplates, I used this thermal plastic material. When you dip the mesh into hot water, it becomes soft and can be laid over a mold. It hardens as it cools and retains the shape. Here is Kevin Gino being fit in his armor for Ulysses. A week before dress rehearsal, as I was a one-man costume shop, I realized I was running out of time. I had to abandon the work on the armor pieces and concentrate on finishing just the helmets and the crowns. The beginning of Achilles' helmet I left the crown open for Celine's hair to be pulled out to replicate the brush on top of some Greco-Roman helmets. 
in the fittings, I trimmed each helmet to fit the placement of the singer's ears and eyes. For Celine, I also added a second layer to give a stronger and square jawline. <clears throat> uh, here you see the final look on Celine on stage with the, the painted helmet. My first fitting with Ara Varuni for the title role, all the ladies' dresses were a variation of this design, stretch velvet with a single sleeve and draping across the back. I was informed at this point that she was going to be more than five months pregnant by the time we got to stage. Oh yeah, this was very funny, right? Because, uh, so as you all know, Iphigenia is, uh, is a virgin, right? And uh, so uh, Iphigenia can't be, uh, she's like sacrificed because she's a virgin. And so Matthew had the challenge to have to um, dress her, but she was like six months pregnant yeah. at the moment yeah. of the of Iphigenia, right? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so this is, this is not, no, she's not pregnant to that degree yet. I put a, a belly pad on her for the fitting. Uh, I lost. Uh, to make sure she had room to grow. So, so the Virgin of Greece had a secret and it was my job to hide it. <laughs> After she left, I took this piece of blue sequin fabric and draped it around the body of the dress form. I then added a, a silver panel to the same shoulder, pinning it into an S curve. The curved edge and all the folds of the draping had to be hand stitched down to the velvet layer. So this is two days before the dress rehearsal. I had a final check on the fit and to mark the hems. At this point, she is about five months pregnant. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, this is our on stage in the finished dress baby fairly successfully disguised. <laughs> uh, I said that Ephesians' love child can remain a secret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, for Queen Clytemnestra, I pinned her fabrics and trim onto a dress form to work out the placement of the colors and to send a picture to Celine for approval. Here's Seanette Sulker in her first fitting there were very few alterations to be done, just a lot of handwork to set all the folds of the draping and to attach the appliques. Uh, here's Shauna on stage in the finished dress, looking quite regal. And uh, this picture of her from the side is my favorite image of her. Yeah, it's very beautiful. Uh, and uh, also all the, the, the profile and the gold, it's really, yeah. uh, uh, she was an amazing, I mean, everyone was amazing, but this was an amazing dress, yeah. I remember. Yeah, it's, it's my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's just one more in the series. Uh, so this is uh, a final shot of the full cast uh, after the final rehearsal, final performance, actually, in, in the, after a long month of, grueling labor. <laughs> yeah, this was a, such an amazing uh, memory, right? And uh, I don't know, for those of you who were at Iphigenia, it's, uh, it was, uh, I mean, a three hours opera and with cuts, otherwise it would have been a four hour opera, right? Uh, and, uh, and so the idea uh, of, as Matthew was saying about the Greek chorus, because uh, if you know Greek mythology, uh, the, 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 um, and the, sorry, Greek uh, theater, um, you know that the chorus was always on stage. But of course, the characters and the chorus were not the same people. Um, but in this case, I wanted that the people and the chorus uh, to be the same people, because my mm -hmm. idea was, uh, what's the difference when you act as a group and as when you act as an individual? So you can, as, as a group, you, you, you want maybe to go to war or you want to sacrifice um, and the group always wins because of the number. And then as an individual, you might want different things. So the whole idea was really to have both uh, the, the, the group and the individual 
uh, as as they can react differently. And Matthew did brilliantly this idea so that to remove, uh, so we had those capes that you can see and with an elastic and we could remove them by pushing front um, and then another character would remove it and we would become the character we, we were supposed to be. Um, and uh, so it was also for us Minerva an amazing uh, journey because it was the first time we were doing first an 18th century opera instead of 17th century opera with big arias, big orchestra, bigger than what we used to have. Um, and uh, so it's, a, it's an amazing memory and thank you Matthew for making yeah. those amazing costumes. Um, and then uh, we uh, are going awesome. to Ermelinda that we did in 2019, uh, which this is 17th century opera. Yeah. So thank you. And uh, right, we, uh, Cindy and I got together, was it last February? to talk about your design concept for Ermelinda. She called it neo-baroque glamour. <laughs> and uh, not knowing what that meant, <laughs> we looked at her Pinterest board together and it translated into a modern twist on 18th century court costumes blended with Turkish and Venetian elements. So one additional important part of her vision was to incorporate some sort of bird cage that Orestio would put over his daughter to try to control her rebellious spirit. Uh, oh, I missed part. <laughs> uh, I used two he hoop petticoats for that to symbolize the constraints they imposed on women in the fashion of that period. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So go to the next one now. So I added a big silk cloak to Armidoro for his first entrance and an or ornate coat for Ormondo to add a bit of the carnival flair. Both of these men's roles were going to be sung by women. So I had to give that careful consideration in planning their design. Here you see Sarah Coulden as Clorindo. Deborah Rosengals sang the role of Rosara's brother. Paying attention to the proportions and cut of the vests and giving them well-fitted tall boots would minimize the lady's feminine shape. Tegan Ronan, our talented makeup artist, was able to dress their hair into an appropriate style for the men of the period. So this image from Pinterest was my inspiration for Rosara's style. Skin carved out of pearl and in a full court wig. As the favorite of the courtesans, I wanted her to be over the top elaborate, bordering on garish. So. After watching Kindra's persona develop on stage, I added two birds tangled up in her wig it seemed like the isolation she encountered after leaving the city or her villa in the country drove her just a little bit stir crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I remember I when you came with the birds, right, to put the, in her yeah, wigs, yeah. it was really funny. And <laughs> yeah, those were added just for opening night. So yeah, we had, they, were, they were added for opening night <laughs> only. <laughs> yeah, there's no, uh, there's no photographs of her in this other than these. <laughs> I found this gold sequin fabric embroidered with pink roses that was perfect for the bodice of her dress. My ODC wouldn't let me cut through any of the flowers. So for, uh, sorry. <laughs> so for every shaping seam, I trimmed around the edge of each rose and leaf and hand stitched them back down to the corset. Repeating this process at every join resulted in a completely seamless finished look. For the skirts, I found this ribbon work rose material in two colors. The background was sheer, so I laid the pink over an aqua silk taffeta for the overskirt. And I laid the blue over pink silk for the panniers. The final touch was to add every silk flower that I owned <laughs> 
around the hips and up along to the bodice. Kendra told me that she could work with any length train, so I put her to the test. She was brilliant wearing this costume on stage. Oh yeah, she yeah. was. She was really great. She yeah. did. Uh, she did so many wonderful things. And for those who were with us that uh, at, at ODC, like at one point she had to uh, uh, to hide uh, and uh, in her dress, ask her to hide herself. And uh, so like hiding for, from, from her, the, the man she's in love with. Yeah. And suddenly she took each part of the dress yeah. and she did this. Yeah. Yeah. And so it looked like almost a mouth, right? Yeah. And yeah. it was so great. Yeah, I wish I had the photograph of that one in the series because- I have one. She did, yeah, <laughs> I mean, not in the, in the slideshow. <laughs> I have one, yeah. Because yeah. she was like hiding behind a wall of flowers made out of her skirt. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Ermelinda. <clears throat> so, this painting by William Charles Ross is titled Victoria Princess Royale in a Turkish Costume. This is my inspiration for Ermelinda's look. On June 4th of last year, Celine contacted me to ask if I could have that costume finished by July 5th for a publicity photo shoot. Nicola wasn't able to come for a fitting until June 17th. A week later, Celine called to tell me that she felt the Turkish costume was a bit too oriental on its own and asked me to add some occidental in elements into my design. This was 10 days before the photo shoot. Yeah, I'm, so. I'm, I'm very mean. <laughs> I ask many changes just before. <laughs> All I can say is thank goodness for Amazon Prime. <laughs> so, so three days later, uh, I had Nika back to fit her in a corset, shoes, and a turban to add into her design. I found these great purple satin pumps with a Baroque heel, but the white lace was so stark, I painted them with a pink highlighter. <laughs> yeah. <So. Yeah. laughs> and I added in a uh, so purple and blue, so that the shoes would match the uh, colors of her corset. Mm. Uh, so, right, so I... Uh, this was a so, turban. Right, I, I got this plain purple velvet turban online, and then I added, uh, what's the next picture? I added this uh, air conditioner phone that you can carve uh, very easily and pinned it on to give the shape of the turban that I wanted it to be. <clears throat> then I added the, you know, wrapped the foam in the silk stripe, uh, added the peacock feathers and the jewel and that part was done. <laughs> so the corset that I got uh, online was, had a beautiful uh, color and pattern to it, but the bottom shape wasn't right for this period. So I cut the bottom off and rebound it in the pointed shape. Yeah, that is, yeah. so you, you, for having it more in a period time, right? Right, because yeah, otherwise this Victorian shape to be more straight around the bottom and this needed to come down to the point in the front. So, so then I took an old uh, white horsehair frill that I had and cut it in half and sew that onto the bottom to start to create the shape of her um, uh, petticoats. Mm -hmm. Over top of that, I took a, a, a pink 1950s tool petticoat and that helped uh, finish off the shape that was gonna work for the period. Mm -hmm. uh, I took muslin then on top of the, the petticoat shapes and draped the shape of the overskirt. I was able to use the muslin as the pattern to uh, lay down on the silk for the finished skirt. Mm -hmm. We're almost done. <laughs> uh, where am I now? Oh yes, I had the uh, straps to the corset also out of the same fabric as the silk to finish off the bodice. And the last step was to 
add this frill of purple lace around the neckline to round it off and give it a more period shape. So, so working down to the wire, the morning of the photo shoot, I added a pink ribbon and pearl embellishment into the lace as a final detail. So in, in just one week, this was the final result, result of all of that work. Yeah. Yeah, and so this was really uh, the, so this was the photo shoot that we used then for, um, for uh, uh, the postcard that you might have received uh, uh, to advertise the, um, the opera that we did. Uh, and uh, so it, Matthew worked very fast uh, in order to um, uh, have the whole costume ready for the photo shoot. Um, and uh, uh, so would you have uh, any questions uh, for Matthew about what he did, uh, uh, um, about the, all the costume, the work uh, in Iphigenia or in Ermelinda? I guess we explained it all. <laughs> I, I'll I'll be the person that does it first. <laughs> um, I um uh, I well I have two questions. Uh, one is about um, I was recently reading about Greek uh, chorus costumes, uh, strangely, and uh, do do did you ever hear about this? Them adding padding to themselves. They would wear these like platform shoes and add padding to themselves. Do, do you, have you heard of this? I just saw a mention in something I was reading briefly recently and I never heard of that. And I, I wonder if you knew anything more about that of like what, what to make themselves look big. I forget why, do you, can you speak to that? I don't know. I remember this that, uh, so I studied uh, Greek uh, tragedy when I was uh, actually in high school and uh, yeah, they had shoes that were very high. Uh, and so they were making themselves higher, right? Uh, and I think, so the, the, the chorus would represent Greek tragedy, we would represent Greece, right, the people. And they were like commenting the whole, the whole yeah. scene, right? Uh, and uh, so they were kind of uh, uh, authority, right? And uh, thinking right. Uh, so, uh, it, so they were higher than anyone else, yeah. right? Yeah, and then I think they added padding to make so they wouldn't look like they were these tall, weird, like like elongated people. They added padding so that they would look just like larger people or something. Yes. I, yeah. yeah. I had never. <laughs> yeah. I thought that's very interesting that they would do that. And the, my other question uh, was about draping. It seems to me that you're very into draping. Is this a very speed? Is this a speed thing for you? And uh, I um. Uh, this uh, <clears throat> before I started working for. Um, Ars Minerva, I'd, I've never done any design work before. I worked for you know, all of my work, mainly was for the San Francisco Opera uh, main stage. I was their men's pattern maker for 29 years. And the way I, I never went to school for pattern making. So the way I would make my patterns is I would take the suit form, pat it up to the measurements of the singer and then take fabric and cut it out and pin it right onto the form to get the, the shapes of the garments. Then you take the muslin, lay it down on paper, trace it off, make the pattern, and then you can use that to cut the fabric. So that's really been my, you know, the way I've done my work for well, 35 years now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a different approach than a lot of people do the pattern making from flat pattern. You get the measurements and you draw it out on paper first, but that's not my forte. Well, I've never really read well, how to making class. <laughs> well, that's why I like the I like seeing the way you work because I mean I understand I can work from patterns, but I also it's sometimes hard to visualize how to how to make the pattern without it being on the body. And I and I so I take inspiration from seeing the way you work. Yeah. I think I'll pursue that more. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, when I first um, uh, was given the design job, I thought, well, I have to draw a picture of, of what I want it to be. And I started drawing the trick picture. I'm like, why am I drawing a picture to show myself what the clothes are gonna be when 
really like when I find the fabrics, they, the, the design comes from the, the way the fabrics speak to me. Not, it's not so much that I draw it ahead of time then try to find fabrics to make that look, which is what uh, my experience was. The way I work is as a designer was to just start with my imagination and the fabric. <laughs> And we have also a comment. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you. <laughs> and we have a comment from also Jonathan Bear who says, such beautiful costume. It was great to see the details close up for the first time. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we thought that uh, about uh, yeah, making uh, more uh, details uh, close ups as well. Um, and a question, what is the most challenging costume you you did you made for Ars Minerva most challenging well <clears throat> well certainly working out how to get those robes off and on on stage was a <laughs> that to me was quite the quite the trick because you know everybody was different they had to have their helmets their crowns underneath take it off not pull off their helmet when they take the robe off and then put it back on and get, that was it took me probably half the time of the entire build was just to get the, the robes right. So it didn't leave me a lot of time to finish the rest of the costumes, but that was a, and also because I'm, you know, the only person I've no staff, like I'm used to at the San Francisco Opera, I had, you know, at least five to seven people working with me just on the costumes I was responsible for. So this was a whole new, uh, whole new way of working. <laughs> Yes, and I remember also that, um, it, I mean, it was difficult because we had all those crowns, right, and, and helmets, and when you removed your, your, your uh, uh, rope, right, of the Greek chorus, you really had to be careful of not taking your crown or your helmet with it. Yeah. So we were, it was very precise. We all had to be, uh, all the singers have been very good with that. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, and I think that in the end it looked great, right? Oh, it, it, it worked great, but it took, <laughs> <laughs> how many tries to get, to get that all to happen? But um, yeah. I think my favorite challenge though was getting Aura to, not look like she was gonna have a baby <laughs> when she got to stage you know that the trick of draping around and, and hiding that uh what was going on there was a real trick and uh, i really enjoyed doing that one i enjoyed doing that one the other one was the harder challenge this was the fun challenge <laughs> yeah and then aurelie didn't look uh didn't look um pregnant at all and i know that no one could know that she was six months pregnant yeah. Um, so uh, we have a question. Please tell us more about the wild color scheme for Ermelinda costume. Ermelinda's costumes, plural. I'm sorry. But, uh, the, the, tell us more about the wild color scheme for all the Ermelinda color, the uh, costumes. Wild, the wild color. Wild, the colors. Oh, the colors. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So I kind of wanted to be like jewels. So everybody had a. a uh, stretch velvet that was in very jewel-like colors and then also um, uh, we had a sequin fabric and another uh, silver, uh, sorry, metallic lame fabric and bringing them all together I just made each one really pop because when you they're all covered up by the plain purple robe you want them to, when they come out from that and their their character to be to, to be dramatic <laughs> so it was all about Getting that drama. <laughs> yeah, and also I remember, so the idea was also Orientalism and uh, that, you know, because the composer and the librettist wrote this opera without having, I mean, I'd, of course I wasn't there at the time, but they didn't seem to have been in Middle East. And it was also the idea oh. of someone who dreams about Middle East without knowing what it is. And so to- uh, We're talking about Erin Linda? Linda, yeah, in Erin Linda. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought she was talking about the... Um... No, no, it was about Ermelinda. Ah, okay, so not even <laughs> sure. Uh, right, it's a whole different thing. So, I'm sorry, the colors of the, Ermelinda. Yeah, yeah Ermelinda. that was a whole different uh, conversation, I'm sorry. I was talking about the, the color of the clothes for Epigene. Uh, 
the main strong colors were really um uh no, they weren't really that to me they weren't the strong colors <laughs> yeah really it was just uh, getting the uh rosara that i wanted her just to be all the colors and everything put on at one time and have her be almost a little vulgar but not really <laughs> yeah yeah, exactly. And the inspiration was very much also Marie Antoinette in the movie of Sofia Coppola, uh, right? Very over the top. Okay. Um, I, we have another question here also. What is your best reward to pleasure on creating the costume for Ars Minerva production? <laughs> I think really just having the, I mean, it's a privilege to me to be part of this company that even though they're so small and new the 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 um quality of the finished product is is is, is it as strong as any uh, actually better than a lot of things that i've seen on the san francisco upper stage oh but, thank uh, you yeah don't don't tell anybody there that <laughs> but no, uh, don't tell anybody <laughs> <laughs> i think just uh being able to be part of it and and be able to bring my uh, expertise and talent and be able to share with them is a a real joy because after I uh, retired from the San Francisco Opera, I thought I would never do this kind of thing again. So this is really my chance to do it all. <laughs> yeah. Well, we are very lucky to have you and very fortunate because what you do is really wonderful and gorgeous. So it's actually our honor yeah. to have you yeah. among yeah. us. <laughs> and there's someone who says, pure magic, your costume are smashing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, any any other questions for Matthew? Any um, technical question? <laughs> Patterns? Oh, yeah. uh, I'm sorry, answer the one question oh, at the wrong opera. <laughs> someone, someone is uh, talking about Miss Alina, but for now we are not going to reveal anything. You'll have to wait for Miss Alina. <laughs> Yeah, we've only just begun to think about what that's going to be. So we, we keep that secret. Yeah. <laughs> you, you have to, uh, to follow up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's going to be very interesting as well, because as you know, Miss Alina is, um, was a very, um, uh, a woman very ahead of her time, uh, very, Libertine, do you say this in English? Yeah, Libertine, yeah. right? Uh, so um, it uh, it created lots of scandals in uh, in Rome, in the Roman Empire. So be ready for uh, maybe costumes <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that are going not to be uh, the you know the mainstream costumes. <laughs> I'm sure, we'll come up with a whole new twist on what you think it will be. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, what, if I can say something is for sure, we have been looking at some Roman uh, also fashion that was considered very, very beautiful at the time and uh, very sexy for women to have golden breasts. And they have found in Pompeii actually golden breasts that women would put on herself. Uh, so it was a big fashion in Rome. So we might have some of this. And maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, it takes uh, 42 to be a libertine. So I hope you can meld with, uh, with seduction, of course, with lots of seduction. <laughs> but also you will see that every character in this opera is actually flirting around with many other characters, um, even if Miss Salina is the one that is uh, designated being really the, <laughs> the one who doesn't behave the right way. <laughs> Any other question for us? Oh. Oh, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, thank you for being with us. <laughs> we are uh, happy always to, uh, to show what we do. And um, if, you if you also have questions uh, that are not here, but later on, please, uh, you can email me, uh, at arsminerva.org. 
uh, and I'll also pass around yes, to, to Matthew. Yeah.